tea time yeah. Make it a difference One cup at a time Tea time So be sure to grab your tea Grab a seat And tune in to Miss Liz Tea time Make it a difference One cup at a time Well, welcome to Tea Time. That's right, Miss Liz is back. And you know what it is. It means that it's storytelling time and words. And I got two incredible authors in the house. And we're going to talk some horror. We're going to get some thriller. We're going to get some deep, deep, scary, frightful conversation going on. And we're going to deep into some tea. Tonight, is, to this, this afternoon's tea is telling everyone about books for Megan and trusting everyone's alien from Kelly. Uh, from from Kelly, yes. And and then we're going to get into their books and all of that good stuff, events and all that cool stuff. So before we get started, we're going to do disclaimer. We're going to get bios. But before any of that, we're going to get you over to Miss Liz's YouTube channel. And we're going to get you to subscribe to Miss Liz's YouTube channel. Now, what does Miss Liz offer you? Well, I offer you over 300 plus interviews with over 67 different countries and over 105 different topics. So I guarantee that there is one topic out there for you to listen to. So let's get started with the disclaimer and bios and let me get in Kelly and Megan. Let's spill some tea together. So the disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Time Live Show. Miss Liz myself is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forward dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the giving time of airing. All tea time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment and taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussions for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It's significant to know that the show is engaging in discussion forums only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Miss Liz, through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in this show today in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that the show is not made for you at this time, I respect those wishes and we'll see you at a later show at a later date time. And again, all regular tea times are hosted on a Thursday, 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you see a tea time on a Monday, Tuesday or Wednesday, it is a rescheduled uh, special or surprise tea time because that's what Miss Liz does. I just serve tea all the time. So now a little bit about my guests. Well, I have two incredible horror writers in the background who are waiting to come in. So we're going to start with Meg Halfdahl is an author, screenwriter, producer, speaker, and podcast podcaster with a passion for horror. Her acclaimed novel series starting with her dark inheritance and the Bram, Bram Stoker Award nominated The Science of Women in Horror showcased her talent. Looking forward to her upcoming book, The Science of Alfred Hitchcock, that came out this October. Kelly Florence is a master of communications and a fierce advocate for female representative in horror. As a teacher and host of the Be a Better Communicator podcast, she brings her theater, theatrical flair to the, to the genre. Together with Meg, she's penned chilling works like the science of monsters and the science of witchcraft. Let me get the ladies in here and let's spill some tea together. Welcome, Kelly. Hello, thank and, you so much for having us. And welcome, Meg. Thank you. Hi. So, first off, ladies, I want to get off starting. I'm going to get Kelly to, to showcase and then I'm going to get to Meg and I'm going to do what I do with everybody. So, Kelly, I'm going to ask you who are you as a little girl and who are you now as a grown woman? You know, I, as a little girl, I loved scary things. I loved scary stories. I was always into movies and TV and theater and dance. And I am proud to say, I would be proud to take a, a, a time machine back to four-year-old Kelly and say, you're living your dreams and you still love all the things you love now. And so I'm very much the same person, but I like being older and wiser. <laughs> Awesome. And Meg, same question for you. Who are you as a little girl and who are you now? I love that. Um, yeah, it's a kind of 
like piggyback on what Kelly said, I also um, feel like I'm very much the same person in that I was a bookworm when I was a little girl. I, I just found comfort in books and I wanted to be a writer from since I can remember, um, my first grade teacher actually gave me a book about how to become an author. And so um, I'm really like living my dreams. Like Kelly said, I still am a bookworm. I'm still got my nose in books. And yeah, of course, I love all the spooky stuff. And I did then too. <laughs> so let's get into that, girls. What got you bold into the spooky genre? You know, I think it was it was a natural thing for me. I just, I craved it. I wanted to see scary <clears throat> movies. I wanted to read scary books, but I definitely have to admit that my dad probably play, had a hand in it because he got me Night of the Living Dead on VHS when I was five. So <laughs> that was my first zombie movie and I was hooked ever since. Yeah, for me, um, I think that definitely my parents had, a, a, a also had a hand in it. I love to watch like Murder, She Wrote and Matlock with my mom. <laughs> um, so I was already like, you know, learning about um, murders, murder mysteries. Um, I think for me, I really love how much emotion there is in horror. And um, I think as a little girl, it kind of resonated with me. Like what's scarier than being a little girl in this world? Um, and so there was something about um, seeing these women often, like final girls, as we call them in horror movies, um, kill the monster, I think is like a really sort of, I don't know, it's, it's a very empowering thing for a little girl to watch. So I think I felt very empowered. And when I saw Lydia on Beetlejuice, I was like, that's me, I'm on TV. So I felt like represented. See, I wouldn't have thought of Beetlejuice as a horror movie, but I guess it's like a, a like a humor horror, yeah, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So what movie was it that impacted your life? Uh, Kelly, you shared a little bit, but what was the one that really, I'm going to do this as I get older? You know, I, I guess it wasn't a movie. It, well, it was. It was a documentary. It was behind the scenes, the making of Michael Jackson's Thriller. The, the music video and it was a documentary and I saw John Landis <clears throat> directing these actors and showing the special effects makeup for a, somebody to become a werewolf and I was like this is what I want to do with my life and I remember I, I was in first grade then and you had to draw what you wanted to be when you grew up and I drew like a werewolf in a chair because it's like I'm going to direct you know, one of these guys and nobody got it. They're like, what you want to be a werewolf? I'm like, no, I want to direct a werewolf. <laughs> right. That's like really creepy. Right. And I'm going to direct. A werewolf. There were a lot of like firemen and teachers and, you know, astronauts for the other kids. And I'm like, werewolf. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Meg, what was it for you? Um, You know, I think for me, I, I've always loved horror TV and movies, but I think like knowing what I wanted to do, which is right, I think came from a love of books. Um, and that was whatever book I was reading at the time. I was like, I want to do that. So whether it be Goosebumps or whether it be Sweet Valley High, when I was reading it as a kid, like I, I was like, I want to make worlds because writers make worlds. And I, and I thought there's no better job um, and I was right. <laughs> um, so as I've read through high school and college and started to sort of cultivate, you know, who I really admire and what I want to write, like um, that took some time. But um, yeah, for me, it was always that sort of reading got me into writing. So you ladies have wrote multiple books together. So how did that begin? And how did the friendship begin? Like, how did you find each other? Yeah, we met uh, over 20 years ago now um, here in Duluth, Minnesota, where I live, um, because uh, Meg was working at a gift shop. I walked in, she saw an X-Files t-shirt I was wearing, and she's wearing one right now, <laughs> and it's not the same shirt. But we bonded over that mutual love of this scary TV show with this strong female character. We exchanged numbers, and we both discovered that we we had this shared love of horror and books and all these other things. And so we started writing plays together way back then and then uh, didn't start writing books together until uh, 2018. So when did you guys actually meet in person? I guess 2000. Yep. Yeah. 
And then, you know, Kelly went on um, an academic path. She's a professor. Um, and we both had um, got married and had kids. And we um, were always like consuming horror, talking about horror. Um, and I went on a, a fiction horror path. Um, I, where I write novels and short stories. And so it just made sense for us to sort of like connect together because we are both such creative people. Um, and we, I think, balance each other out and also like challenge each other to be better. So I think um, writing together was just natural. So the reason that we're here today is this book that you guys wrote together and it's called Travel of Terrors. Uh, I, in strange and spooky spots across America. So in this book, would we find actual places that are scary and spooky? Yes, absolutely. We visited 12 different cities across the United States and we tell everyone the best place to stay, like a haunted hotel, the best tours to go on, the best restaurants to eat at, the best shops to find your horror stuff. We always visit a bookstore in the town and talk to locals. And it's really about history and culture and lore and all of the scary things in these cities. Yeah, we did. We did the hard work, though. We stayed in the haunted hotels. We went on the cemetery tours. Um, we went on the tunnels of Portland. We um, went to an abandoned, with permission and with people who, who owned it, I might add, we went to an abandoned um, mental um, asylum. Um, so we, we did the, we, we put ourselves in the, uh, the crosshairs of ghosts. <laughs> and you guys spent the night there? Not at in, the asylum. <laughs> yeah, but, but at, at several places. Uh, uh, one place that we stayed in Portland, Oregon, began as a poor farm and then it became an asylum. And now they've turned it into hotel rooms. And then uh, Meg, tell about your favorite place that we stayed. Oh, um, my favorite place to stay was the Lizzie Borden bed and breakfast. Um, she is known, she's notorious for uh, killing her parents with an ax. And it was happened in this house and now it's a bed and breakfast. And so we stayed in her bedroom and I was waiting to get haunted. She did not haunt me, but I have been a, like, just absolutely fixated on the Lizzie Borden case. This was, this would happen in the 1890s. Um, my whole life, really, I found out about her from a, an old TV movie and I just became fixated about um, this murder. And so staying in the house after I've read so many books and watched so many documentaries, it was very cool. <laughs> So how long did this book take to put together? You know, we wrote it fairly quickly um, because we, our publisher gave us a deadline. And so we traveled a lot. We would usually go to two cities in, on every trip. And then um, the editing process and the illustration process took longer. It's every chapter is illustrated with wonderful drawings that represent what we saw and talked about in in all of our visits. And so it was so worth the wait for it to come out. So how did you guess the title? <laughs> well, um, you know, that is actually when you, when you're working with, you know, a big publisher that they, they have actual like, um, uh, like meetings of, with people and focus and, like, groups, focus yeah. groups. That's the word I was trying to think of. Yeah. They actually have post focus groups. So actually it started out with a different title. I think like so many books, um, which was a uh, goth girls guide to travel because we really want to speak to girls like us, but we realized that um, that was maybe a little limiting because there are so many awesome people who, who love the goth lifestyle. And so I think travels of terror um, is a little more welcoming to every, one, not just goth girls and uh, I think it worked out <laughs> so tell us a little bit about focus groups we have a list uh, have a listener here that wants to know more about it oh yeah so just we're with products or books or commercials or movies they get together a group of people and get their opinions about whatever it is that they're they're promoting and then they take that feedback and they say these people said they like this one the best or like this better than that. And they do it with enough people so that it's scientific data that it comes back and they can see, you know, with numbers, what makes sense. So is that like a bunch of like uh, different editors and publishers and stuff like that as well? Or no, it's it regular. It's regular people, regular readers, regular 
people. I was, I was in a focus group many, many years ago for a movie and I gave my feedback and the movie came out and it got good reviews. So <laughs> thanks to me. Just kidding. <laughs> so let's go into the movies guys. Has any of your books turned into a movie? Oh, I wish we're, we're um, Kelly and I are working on that. Um, we do have representation in that way. And um, we're always working, you know, we, we not only do I love books, but I love movies. And um, as Kelly was saying, she wants to direct a werewolf. I mean, we have to make that happen. <laughs> so um, yeah, we're, we're, um, we, we're working on t in a television front as well. Um, and so, you know, I think like so many creative people, um, there's so many avenues to go down. Um, and Kelly has a lot of background in TV and film. Um, and while I'm more like based in, in writing fiction and things like that, um, but I want to know more and I want to learn more. So I've been learning along a uh, the last couple of years. So to make a short story long, um, we're trying. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's listeners out there that listen to Tea Time. You just never know what might happen. You mm -hmm. might direct that werewolf. Like, right. Kelly, let's get into that werewolf because I want to go into the werewolf uh, with you. Uh, what is it about the werewolf that really draws you in? You know, I think something Meg and I talked about ever since we met, and then we also wrote about it in our books, is that the thing about a werewolf that's so scary is that it's somebody you know and love. And usually the lore is that when they turn into a werewolf, they're, they're not self-aware that they're the werewolf. So they could come and hurt you or haunt you or, you know, scare somebody in your family. And that to us was terrifying because it's like there's no control. And also it's just cool. It's cool special effects to see the full moon comes out and, and somebody turns into this you know a werewolf and we love how in recent years the, over the past couple of decades now there's female representation as werewolves and you know different origin stories and sometimes the werewolves talk now and and it's all fun awesome you know I, we always wonder why we aren't drawn to certain things right i'm drawn to vampires i don't know what it is about vampires but i just think that they're really cool um, yeah. But I w always wanted to be a werewolf, too, because I, I find that they have some kind of strength in them, right? Some hidden strength. Uh, Absolutely. Meg, if, if you could be any character, what would you be? A vampire, a werewolf, a zombie? Well, what would you be? This is tough because vampires are, like, naturally, I think, sexy. <laughs> <laughs> I think vampires always have the sex appeal. But I kind of like how werewolves just bust out of their clothes. Um, so I don't know. I think I'm more of a werewolf because I'm a dog person. And I the idea of like being a dog kind of appeals to me, I guess. So I think I think I'm more were more, more werewolfy. I feel like with a vampire you have to like really <clears throat> have a great wardrobe. You have to like you know, be looking great. I just feel like vampires are very hot and sexy and that's like a lot of pressure. <laughs> but I also think that we would both fit in well as ghosts because we could just like show up and like watch a movie in a theater or go read a book behind I someone's shoulder in the library. library. Yeah. <laughs> big, not, big ghost story, right? Let's get into the ghost stories. Let's get into the paranormal. Has anything ever happened to you guys when you were writing a book? Yes. So... We both, uh, speaking of the X-Files, we both uh, kind of viewed ourselves more as Scullies, who are, were more skeptical than Mulders, who, believe, who Mulder believes in everything. And going into this, writing this book, when we were traveling, we went in with an open mind, but we were still kind of skeptical. And we both did end up having scary experiences. I saw a ghost with my eyes and also just the change of vibes in certain places. You could just feel entering a space that something had happened there. Yeah. What about you, Meg? Yeah. Um, for me, I think where I felt like the most profound um, sort of otherworldly feeling was St. Augustine, Florida. Um, there's a lot of history there. And I know, like, when we were standing out some, outside some of the cemeteries there, I just felt like a really, um, I always describe it as whether you believe in ghosts or not, I think we've all walked into a room and, like, just felt like an off feeling, like, it, almost like somebody just had a fight in there or something. And I just had, like, those negative kind of feelings um, in, in some areas in St. Augustine. And then also, um, Kelly and I were sharing a hotel room, and I kept thinking she 
I, I was like, she keeps getting up to go to the bathroom. Like, is she okay? And then I realized she was not getting up to go to the bathroom. There was just footsteps happening in the room. And I had never had an experience like that before. Um, my whole life. I mean, and I've been in many places that maybe seem like they would be haunted, but it, it was just this kind of hotel room that has some history, but um, you just never know. And I think, I think what we learned is just to be a little more open. I think as we get older, we're actually kind of loosening the grip a little bit more and like being more um, curious and more interested in what really is beyond the veil. I think it's very cool to think about anyway. So we have a question here. Does it take a lot to scare you two girls? <laughs> I think, yeah, probably. Like we're not jump scare kind of people. Like we, if we go into a haunted house or if we see a movie where there's a big jump scare, we tend to like, maybe we'll jump, but we'll laugh about it. And it's, and we're not like terrified. I think the things that are scariest to us when we wrote and researched about, um, serial killers for our book the science of serial killers that stuff was really scary and terrifying because it, it actually happened and we had to kind of step away and watch a romantic comedy once in a while <laughs> while we were writing that book because it's you know it was heavy I, I was also gonna say that my teenage son for the first time drove to Kelly's house we live four hours apart and he drove like through big cities to get to her house this last weekend. And that is probably the most <laughs> scared I've been in a while oh. <laughs> until I heard that he was okay. I hit was driving my younger son in the car. I was like, yeah, so that's, that stuff scares me. <laughs> yes. Our kids are our best friends as well. Yeah. Which is fun. But you know, that is the thing. It's real things that are scary. And like I said, speaking of this, Meg, I said to my parents, I'm like, am I ever going to not be worried when they're, the kids are driving somewhere? She's like, no, that's why I always ask if you made it there safe. Like every time you go somewhere, I'm like, oh, yeah. it's yeah. just a mom thing. <laughs> yeah, there's mom scares for you. <laughs> right? That and that and That's a real horror, being a mom, yep. right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Truly. Do you guys ever write a book on the mom horrors? You know, yeah. we we have we've written um we wrote three chapters in our science of women in horror uh, book about motherhood and how it's featured in the horror genre and then a screenplay that we are adapting well not adapting we've written it um to be filmed it also deals a lot with motherhood so we have definitely thought a lot about about that topic i think it would make a real good thriller like yeah yeah <laughs> all the different mothers out there right just yeah. panicking and yeah. afraid uh, you know, there's big moments in life that are really scary, and it's not like a horror movie. But I'm like, like getting married, going to college, uh, mm -hmm. being coming an empty nester. Uh, you know, there's so yeah. many different horrors there, right? It would it would be fun to sort of depict those things as like a horror, like like as a zombie or like as like something like that. But it's you know, it's that's not really what's happening. That's just what it feels like's happening. So yeah, good idea. <laughs> That'd be cool. I, I I know I would be interested in that. Uh, <laughs> I want to I want to get into Stephen King. So what is it about Stephen King that really draws your attention, ladies? Um, he's he's an extremely talented writer. Um, I am. So I I have like taken all a bunch of snooty literature classes, and um, and I love all the snooty literature too. Um, but I had you know. I've had students, fellow students in my class, like really malign Stephen King and be like, oh, that's not, you know, that's just whatever, like that's not literature. Um, but I'm a big proponent that it is and that um, some of his works, you know, are going to really stand the test of time for many, many years. Um, and he creates such empathy with his characters. I love his absurd sense of humor and how he sees the world. Um, he ties horror in with, a real human emotion, whether it be grief or, you know, all the things you were just talking about, um, all those scary things in life, he ties that in with like, you know, horror, like Pennywise or with Cujo. Um, so I think he's a brilliant writer and um, we were absolutely thrilled to be able to write a book about him. You know, interest, side note, interesting enough, I was talking, I was teaching my students yesterday about memory and talking about long-term memory. And I... One Of course, one of my long-term memories is um, from my childhood, watching The Shining for the first time with my dad. 
and a student said, raised her hand and she said, my first memory is a red balloon floating above my bed. And I'm like, Pennywise? <laughs> and she's like, I don't know, but it's always like in my mind that it scared me. And I'm, and she said she was little, little. So anyway, <laughs> y'all have <laughs> the shining is things. what has caused me not to watch horror films. And my kids get a kick out of it, especially my son. He's like, mom, let's just watch it. And, and they, they know that I jump scare easy. <laughs> And he's like, it's not coming. It's not coming. And I'm covering my eyes. And he's like, I swear, mom, I put my hands down. But it's right there. Like they, yeah. they time it perfectly oh, to they know scare me. Doing. Yeah. You know, one, one thing we've discovered through our nonfiction books is that we have brought a lot of people over that threshold of being too scared to watch a horror movie and then being able to watch it after they read our books because they see like how it was made and what it's based on. And then it became like kind of a step away from what's on the screen and and uh but we we still we have uh, one of our best friends will still jump six feet in the air if, if there's a jump scare <laughs> oh I, I i'm that person too like i jump easy like you just come in the room and go boo and i'm like I, okay <laughs> like, i'm out of here <laughs> Oh, yeah, I can see your kids having fun with you then. <laughs> oh, yeah, like even video games. There's this video game where it has octopus in it, and I just don't like the eyeballs on it. And every time that <laughs> octopus comes, to, and it's a surfing game, and my, my son keeps telling me, Mom, it's just a surfboard. And I'm like, that <laughs> octopus needs to stay away from me. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. They are creepy, though, because they're way too smart, those octopus. octopus. Right? Oh, and they, can, and they can squeeze into this really small spaces. I don't yeah. like that. They are creepy. <laughs> <laughs> right it's the eyes for me it's like uh, okay. um yeah. my 13 year old yesterday told me that school the the colossal squid no the giant squid because that's a diff there's difference the giant squid their eyes are the size of basketballs gross see and i see? was like Stop. the eyes are huge <laughs> like i'm just like i uh, no, i can't do that oh <laughs> and he said their brain is a donut shape that goes around the eye disgusting that's disgusting <laughs> stop like that's that's okay that does scare me <laughs> i want to go back to the werewolf <laughs> yeah <laughs> right it, it it's just amazing what scares you in life like mm -hmm. uh you know this video game my kids get a kid and like they always mom you want to play we i'm like yeah let's do a dance party or do something else and they're like mom the surf uh, no <laughs> <laughs> you don't long it's no longer here it's been gone uh but yeah when they need a good laugh that's what they say they, they're just like mom let's play the surfboard yeah and just like, <laughs> so and i can't swim so that even gives me fear like oh. i'm playing a thing and i'm i fall in the water I'm just, and my kids are always like it's not true mom it's <laughs> it's not like real a movie. water it's not real <laughs> <laughs> it seems real though some of those games some of those 3d games and stuff <laughs> right so yeah. when you guys are building like your storylines and that in your books how, how do you go about that um so i so for storylines for fiction writing um we do screenplays together so we will sit and like just kind of throw stuff at the wall i think is probably the first way to do it we know you know, kind of like talking about what's scary. I think Kelly and I have a really good like vocabulary back and forth. You know, we can communicate to each other what's scary. And I think we also can communicate really well with like what characters we really kind of like to delve into, like mothers, for instance. Um, so I think there's just a lot of communication um, when we're doing fiction together. And then um, when we're doing nonfiction, um, there's still a lot of communication. It's just different we we divvy up things um like for instance the Stephen King book um you know Kelly knows a lot about the the uh, JFK assassination so um when we were like who's going to do 11 22 63 the book that he did on that then that naturally is going to go to Kelly because that's kind of her wheelhouse and she knows about that so there are a lot of things non-fiction wise that we kind of divvy up based on instinct um, but yeah, I think, I think like anybody, it's a lot of throwing stuff at the wall, right, Kelly? <laughs> yeah. And when you, when Meg said that we have a shared vocabulary, sometimes it's like, oh, and then it'll be like, da. And yeah. like, yes, exactly. <laughs> like we know what these sounds mean or the a gesture yeah. or a, a facial expression change. And we've learned that, you know, it's good to have a part of a plan and outline, but to go with the flow of creativity and not to stick to that so much that it becomes boring and you, you're just, you know, 
uh, working on something that isn't a good path. And so yeah. if it's not exciting to both of us, then we know let's pivot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even in like research, when you're, when we are doing research for like, let's say we take a film and we're like, okay, we, we want to, or a Stephen King book, and you know, you start to kind of peel back the layers. Sometimes you'll find something and it's just like, yeah, I don't really feel like reading anymore <laughs> about that. Um, that's a sign that nobody else wants to either. And so, you know, just change, change your trajectory. And I think it's funny because it's so different, but it's the same in fiction. It's like, if you're, if you're getting bored with that, um, there's like a, a saying, I, I, I want to say it's Robert Frost, but it's like, you know, if you cry, the reader cries with you, right? Like it's, it's sort of like you have to have that emotional um, capital within the story, whether it's fiction or nonfiction for the reader to have that emotional capital. Uh, when you when you were saying you throw it at the wall, I can see these blogs like these goopy things that my kids yeah. used to have, like a smacky hand. Yeah, and just, like gack. you know, like <laughs> is this one? <laughs> uh, no, that one's not. Well, let's save that one out. Like, yeah, <laughs> sometimes it feels like that. <laughs> and you know, one thing that a professor in grad school told me, and I I tell this to students all the time, and other creatives, as she said, in it was in terms of photography, but she believes it's in terms of writing. If everyone is looking at something happening and taking pictures over here, turn around and take a picture of what's happening behind because you want to explore the stories and the people and the voices that aren't always uplifted or aren't always the focus. And I think that that's, it's a different way. It's a different thread to follow in some of these, you know, these in nonfiction and fiction so that it's, it's interesting and fresh and not dull. Yeah. Well, let's go back to the serial killers because you said that was some of the ones that really like scared you. Like, what is it about true crime that really just impacts yeah. a good storyline for you guys? Um, well, you know, I think for Kelly and I, like when we started writing the book, it was really important to us that um, we knew we were going to be talking about some, you know, more well-known serial killers um, and some lesser known. But it was really important to us that we didn't, um, make it feel like, you know, we've written books about monsters in cinema, and we didn't want that same feeling with the serial killers, because um, Frankenstein's monster, he's cool. Um, the Wolfman, he's cool, because they're fictional. Um, but the, these, these real monsters, um, they should not be put on a pedestal, we should not see them as sort of like a commodity that we should wear a t shirt of. Um, we shouldn't like um, sort of think that they were really cool. And so I think that was kind of like the first thing in really creating a good story, so to speak, um, in these chapters and really trying to highlight um, the victims. For instance, um, we talk about the movie From Hell, which is about um, Jack the Ripper and Jack the Ripper's victims were sex workers, uh, mostly. And um, there's a great book called The Five by Haley Rubinfeld um, that is about um, the five women who were murdered by Jack the Ripper. And um, it's really about them. It, it has nothing really to do about Jack the Ripper. It's about their lives. And she goes into all the research she could do about them. And I think those were the kind of places we wanted to start with. Um, victim stories um, told with empathy. And that's different than highlighting you know Hannibal Lecter for instance so um I think for us it was kind of like what Kelly was saying flipping the story everybody's looking at Ted Bundy but let's kind of look behind uh Ted Bundy and we got into science um which we do in all of our books um which is another way in um that I think makes our book unique one Kelly, little what was it for you yeah, I was going to say one little plug. Same thing as Meg said, taking it uh, from a different perspective. Uh, this movie that just came out and I just watched it last night, uh, Woman of the Hour, about the um, dating game killer. Uh, Anna Kendrick directed it. And as a woman's perspective, what she did as a director is she never highlighted the violence. She would highlight the true horror of when a woman felt or knew that they were in danger. And I think as some male directors and, and female, but male directors historically have focused on that gore and that violence and not glorifying it, but maybe in, in a way. And what this 
film did and what other films that we've uh, written about do is flip that narrative and show the, the people, these victims, as fully fleshed out human beings who, you know, had a life and a past and a personality. And no, that, that moment of fear is the moment of realizing danger. It, we're, it's not the moment of death. Yeah, I and I'm I'm a big fan. Well, I'm well, not a fan, but I like to watch crime stories and true crimes because I like to understand people's minds, right? Their mm -hmm. mindset of where they were, why they did this, what got them to there, right? Especially mm -hmm. a serial a serial killer, like you know what what happened to them as a child for them to turn into that. You know, yeah. uh, have you ever watched like, a true crime story and said, wow? <laughs> All the time. There's so many good ones lately. I'm just like, I'm watching true crime all the time and um, it's it's fascinating. Um, yeah, I think we're all fascinated by it because of the psychology, right? Because it's so different. It's so vastly different from how our brains work. But, you know, to go into what we're saying about werewolves um, and why those are appealing, I think that the reason that we're interested in, in werewolves, in Jekyll and Hyde, in Frankenstein's monster, in in real monsters, serial killers, is because there is this little tiny teensy teensy part of us that's dark and that has thoughts sometimes about like, oh, wouldn't it be nice if I just killed everyone and I had, I had one night to We all get those thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. We don't admit to that, but but it's it's um I think that because obviously we would never act on that and they're never as depraved obviously as like you know the reality um i think we all have that little dark seed within us and so it's fascinating to see it reflected in such a funhouse mirror of distortion because that's not like that's not our reality but it how interesting to see a, an episode of snapped where a mom just snapped um because that doesn't happen every day um, so yeah, I, I think true crime will for always, it always has been and always will be an interest to, you know, the rest of us. And Kelly, for you, was there ever like a wow moment when you watched a true crime story? I think, you know, doing our research and just watching, like Meg said, there's this plethora of, of docu-series that are out now. And the thing that I really appreciate uh, uh, just for, uh, footage wise is that there's so many, uh, CCTV cameras now and everyone has a cell phone so there's so much basically found footage that we get that we can piece together and pr hopefully solve a lot of these crimes um, and then doing our research I think the a big aha moment was seeing how these killers it sometimes it's nature sometimes it's nurture sometimes that you know they it lead could have contributed to their their thinking off other times they were exposed to violent things uh, because of how they were raised or who they were raised with. Other times it seems like they were the nice guy next door. And it's, it's all fascinating psychologically. Yeah. Well, and like you said, there's a lot of cameras out there now so we can catch them, right? We're back in the 60s and 70s. There wasn't as much cameras and phones and videos. But there was a lot and of yeah, videos. Yeah. Like when I watched some of the true crimes, I'm really surprised on how many people did family videos. Like, you know, like, <laughs> right? yeah. I know, right? <laughs> I'm just or like, where was that camera? <laughs> like, <laughs> my favorite ones though are the cults, the cult ones I do now, and like the the cult leader always wants everything on video, and then it always gets them in trouble in the end. But they want like everything because they're every narcissists. They yeah, because <laughs> they're narcissists, and it's like, oh, oh that's funny. <laughs> And it, it goes to show, right, that there is a lot of sick and evil out there in the real world. But then when mm -hmm. we want and when we write, you know, fiction and that we, we try to take you to a different level of mm -hmm. horror, right? Like werewolves mm -hmm. and zombies and all of that. Mm -hmm. Now, do you guys believe in werewolves, zombies, vampires? Do you do you believe in that at all? You know, not I guess not in that literal sense. But what, when we wrote our book, our very first book, The Science of Monsters, we explored the legends and lore and medical conditions that contributed to people thinking that, you know, these creatures existed. And so there really are people with werewolf syndrome who believe they are werewolves. And there's people with, you know, hair all over their bodies. And there's there are people in cultures who drank blood because they thought that it was healing or and that they used it to survive. And so we can see how 
just things that were not explained at the time could be mistaken for monstrous. Yeah. Yeah. You can only use the context of like what you've grown up in. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's been really interesting to, to do research on that. And like Kelly said, you know, people were like, well, this must be a vampire because they have prophyria and they can't go out in the light. So, you know, they aren't thinking in any sort of medical terms. They're thinking supernatural terms. Um, you know, people in Ireland up until, I mean, I think one woman, um, was killed by her husband because he thought she had been taken over by fairies. And this was in like, you know, the 19, I want to say maybe thirties or forties or something. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, these, these ideas, um, have perpetuated for a long time. Um, but thankfully now, you know, we're based in science and medicine and, and we, we know better not to, um, to vanquish these people or have another witch hunt, so to speak witch hunt that, you know that and that's that was also a good movie right a lot of uh witchcraft and stuff like that that we don't we don't see very much movies on the witches brews or stuff like that anymore we see more yeah. vampires werewolves right the witches are starting to decrease I I, yeah i think so i think i feel like they're kind of coming back and i think that there's more power i think that witches used to be very monstrous um but i think we might be getting like maybe some more empowering witches in in media i know wicked's coming out um yeah the Ooh, film yeah. So, and agatha um, all along i i haven't started oh, it yet but i yeah. was at a movie with some friends last night and they said it is glorious oh so. great yeah i haven't seen it either but um so yeah i think i think which the witch is kind of changing in media a little bit yeah yeah well, it's just like motherhood, right? It changes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, goes through, goes through different phases. <laughs> Meg, I'm going to start with you with your tea. You told me uh, telling everyone about books. Why yeah. those three words for your tea? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, as I, as I <clears throat> mentioned, I profess I'm a book nerd. I'm a bookworm. Um, so obviously, I talk about my own books that I've written, Um which, you know, Travels of Terror, our whole horror, uh, science of horror, um, and also my novels and all that. Um, but I also just love talking about the books I read. I read pretty voraciously. I read multiple books um, at once. Um, and I will tell anybody and everyone who wants to know or doesn't want to know um, about the books I'm reading. And I'm just a really big believer that, um, you know, the lifestyle of reading and writing is, um, well, it makes me happy and it's not for everybody, but I think a lot of people appreciate, um, sharing about books. And I've really been pleased on social media, how many people, um, you know, I think through the pandemic, people kind of found books again. Um, and, and, you know, I think there's this like pervading notion that, um, books are dying or like you know we're not gonna have bookshops or libraries or something but I just don't think that's true I think they're actually really coming back um with a vengeance and um with TikTok trends and on Instagram all the the book accounts um I'm just really pleased to see that everyone's reading you know as you're sharing Meg I'm like seeing this book library story come to life like this horror like I don't <laughs> give up on us books like you know we're coming for you the like books. as you're sharing I can just see these different plots Have coming and I was just like wow <laughs> <laughs> I love it I love it <laughs> So Kelly, you gave me trusting everyone's alien. So tell us trust why every you... trust every alien. Yeah. <laughs> so and tell it, me why those ones. Well, it goes back to uh, my love of the X Files and and the supernatural and aliens, but it also is you know that term alien. It's some it's something foreign to us. And I know I fell in love with some monsters, not literally, but I empathize with them. Frankenstein's monster in in the original movie version of movie adaptation of Frankenstein, I felt for him and he didn't mean to hurt anybody, but they were mean to him. King Kong, they should, they took him out of his environment. He didn't want to be in New York city. And so, um, Oh, and Meg, you'll love this in the movie I saw last night. It's called your monster. He is a voracious reader and he has like Shakespeare memorized and he does <gasps> monologues and sonnets oh. and, it's so romantic he's, and he's just always <laughs> looking for his next book. And so that's, it's like, yeah, see, somebody might look scary, 
but they can be a nice guy like or a nice e. girl. E.T. <laughs> e. I think it's really cool. You know how horror just takes and, and connects everybody together, right? Through conversation and through book yeah. telling and story playing and movies and all of that. Uh, how how have you guys looked at your friendship in a horror way? Like if you, if you could write a horror story about your friendship, what would you <laughs> write? How would it go? I think that our bodies like sort of like melt together like we we sit and watch so many horror movies that i think it's a body horror where we like <laughs> become <laughs> we become like one entity with two heads right kelly yeah and we have the grady girls uh tattooed on our shoulders and they yeah. uh, when we stand next to each other they hold hands i my my initial thought was we would cover for each other's crimes neither not that either of us are going to commit any crimes but we I would did, help each I, other bury a body i did admit to some dark thoughts earlier so yeah there you go <laughs> meg i'm on my way <laughs> there's some what incredible things coming <laughs> so you ladies i asked you what your favorite color was and i got black and yellow so who's black and who's yellow i'm black i'm yellow so why yep. those colors ladies Okay, Kelly, you go first. I mean, I, I sh <laughs> my favorite color shouldn't be black. I mean, it's it's dark and it's gothic. But I have a white cat and an orange cat now that my daughter ado adopted. And so I just constantly have cat hair on everything I own. <laughs> <laughs> Every black thing. Yeah. Um, my, color, my favorite color, I decided when I was five that my favorite color was yellow. And, like, I am, I will never give that up. Like, to me, like, when you're five, that's, like, peak, like, you know what your favorite color is and I just love it it's bright I can't I can't pull it off I can't wear it but it's bright it's beautiful it makes me happy um I like like things I love yellow flowers I love yellow anything um yeah I can't Kelly's got yellow glasses on those look good but I, <laughs> I cannot pull off like, that's color. why I worded it that way because I yeah. wanted to see the oh, listeners yeah. we're gonna pick up who's yellow who's black <laughs> yeah right <laughs> Um, no, I think, I think my five-year-old self just knew the right favorite color and it's yellow. And you hadn't even read the yellow wallpaper yet. I know. I love that story too. So, <laughs> so and I asked you ladies, your one word to describe each, each other and Kelly, you gave me caring and, and Meg, you gave me thoughtful. So yeah, Kelly, let's go first with your caring. Why that word? Yeah, I just, I think we both, Meg and I both come from a place of wanting each other to be better. Like Meg said, challenging each other and making each other better. And at the end of the day, caring and taking that time and grace of like, I don't feel like working today. Like, take, take a break. I'll take this, you know, this chapter or this thing. And just knowing that we have grown up together, even though we didn't grow up together, but we've grown so much in our lives and experienced so much with each other and our kids feel like, you know, her kids feel like my kids and I, I think vice versa. And we're just so, it's just like one big happy family. <laughs> <laughs> um, I chose thoughtful because um, that's just a really nice way of saying brilliantly smart. Um, I, and also I think that um, thoughtful means like kind of all the things Kelly was saying too. But, like, um, I think both Kelly and I are um, thoughtful about other people. We're thoughtful about ourselves and what we need. Um, we're thoughtful about everything that we do. You know, even though I was saying we throw things at the wall, you know, when it comes to, like, you know, um, really putting ourselves out there in the world, I think that we're very thoughtful about how we do it. So, um, yeah. I think it's really cool because Kelly gave me Carrie and you gave me thoughtful which is comes together, right? It's that blend of coming yeah. together. Yeah. You know, uh, for your children, how do they feel about you guys being horror writers? <laughs> I think my kids sort of think it's cool, but they would never admit that to me. I've heard them like say, <laughs> yeah, like, of course, yeah. our kids would never do that. right? Yeah. Like <laughs> their teachers will be like, Oh, you know, they're, they're, they told me about what you do. You know, they, they think it's so cool, but like they would never, they would never like be like, mom, you're so cool. <laughs> <laughs> so um, they don't read my books. Um, maybe someday, I hope maybe they'll like crack 
they'll crack a page and read. Um, but uh, I, I can't force them, right? I have to kind of like let them find them on their own. So <laughs> no, exactly. And I, my kids do, they're very supportive and they always help out at book events and things. So um, they're not embarrassed by it. I think we can say that much. <laughs> I think it's really cool. Like, you know, like, what did your mom write? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's pretty scary. You know, <laughs> uh, Kelly, what was the first book that you ever wrote? Uh, the, the first one that I had published was the science of monsters with Meg. And Meg, what was it for you? Um, I wrote, uh, I had a book come out in 2015 called Twisted Reveries, 13 Tales, 13 Tales of the Macabre. That's, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, it's um, 13 short stories. I'm, I'm really passionate about short stories, especially in, in the horror or thriller genre. I think they're a really fun um, way into the genre and uh, as a writer and a reader. So um, yeah, I was, I was lucky enough to have um, three books in that series published. Um, but, but yeah, that was my first. And what has writing horror taught both of you guys mm. as individuals? I think, as Meg was saying, right off the top of why we love the genre, it's given us so much empathy for different viewpoints and different people. And, and then things that we kind of used to dismiss as casual readers or casual viewers, now that we've delved into it deeper, either in a fiction realm or nonfiction, it's given us a deeper appreciation for all the work put into it and all these different viewpoints. And I think we appreciate, I think we appreciate it more than we did before. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. Like we appreciate reading and watching it more because we kind of know how the, the sausage is made, so to speak. Um, I think that yeah, I mean, right. I, I'm basically mirroring what Kelly said, but it it puts you in a state of, of empathizing. And I think that something that I strive for in my fiction is to write about people who are complicated and don't always make their best decision and have messed up in their lives. And I think that the more you write from that perspective about different characters, the more your heart opens to different viewpoints. And um I think that's why people like horror. I think that you get to, you know, see somebody on the worst day of their life and, and, you know, you hope that they prevail, even if they, even if they've done something bad in their life, um, you kind of see this as like a redemption. And I think that there's something so um, magnetic about that. I love it. And let's go back to the book that we're here for, why we came here and who got you here. So a big shout out to Mickey Mickelson from Creative Edge for sending Hi, Meg and Kelly. Uh, but what was your favorite chapter in Travel of Terrors for each of you? Yeah, I think uh, one obviously that I loved researching and writing was right here in Duluth, Minnesota. Meg grew up here in, in her high school years and I moved here uh, later. But there's something amazing about exploring your own backyard and discovering things that, you know, kind of seeing your own town as a tourist. And I learned so many, we both did, but we learned so many stories and heard, met so many people that we wouldn't have unless we had written this book. And it really gave a new perspective to just driving down the streets now. I'm like, hey, somebody said something happened over there, or there's this new place, to, this new restaurant to try. Things that, it just opened my eyes. And for you, um, for me, I really, um, because of the book stuff, I really enjoyed, um, we wrote a chapter on Providence, Rhode Island, and um, they have a place there called the Athenaeum, which is this very old library, one of the first libraries in the country. And the history there was amazing. Um, obviously, that which means there are amazing literary ghosts. Um, but also, um, just the, um, just being in there <laughs> and just smelling all the old books, um, was very exciting for me. And, um, just the town itself has like very, a very, um, literary background. Um, um, it's the home of H.P. Lovecraft and all of that. So, um, I really enjoyed that. I, I ended up reading a whole book about, um, Sarah Whitman, who I'd never heard of before, who's from there and, and quite, um, profoundly affected, American literature. So um, anytime I have an excuse to like learn about a woman that I didn't know, a writer, um, that was really cool. So what was the, the location that took you guys the furthest for this book? Hmm. 
Hmm. I guess, te- well, we were on both sides of the coast. So we were all the way from Salem, Massachusetts to Los Angeles, California. And we did that in, in the same trip, which is like, <laughs> what were we doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, 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 you know, we would love to write another version of this um, book, you know, in Canada or in um Europe or you know wherever so um you know this was kind of a a love letter to American ghosts but there's so many more ghosts for us to find (laughs) yeah so many different countries that you guys could travel and yes (laughs) (laughs) you could make a series out of this right like Canada (laughs) Australia Ireland uh you know there's so many different places Mm -hmm. so any future plans for any future books on this on the tri- uh, tribal uh, terror, you know we're um, we've got a pitch that ready to go for our next travel book, and then we have the science of Alfred Hitchcock coming out in twenty twenty five. Wow! So, if anybody wanted to get your books, where could they find them? Um, we're everywhere. We're on Amazon. Um, obviously, we you know love it when people go to small bookstores and ask for us; they'll order it for you. Um, Travels of Terror is at Barnes and Noble, and I think our other science books are there as well. Um, and um, you can find my fiction books on Amazon. You can also go to inklingspublishing.com and get my books there as well. Um, but yeah, we're kind of everywhere. <laughs> so do you guys have any upcoming events or any uh, podcast uh, interviews coming up that you'd like to get out there? Lots of stuff happening. I know your listeners might be everywhere, but um, we have, well, we're going to be volunteering at Scarium at the aquarium here in Duluth in a couple of days. It's for kids to come through and get some spooky things. And then um, we have a couple other events next week. We're October is our busy month. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're kind of sticking to Minnesota right now for the rest of October, but um, we just came off of a two week book tour where we were, all over the country again, um, which was really fun. But yeah, our October is always pretty packed. <laughs> so Kelly, your final message to all the listeners out there on horror, what what message and tips and tools would you like to leave for all the future writers of horror? Yeah, future writers, I would say, uh, don't edit yourself in the beginning, just go for it. I think all of us when we especially when we first start writing, We start on that first blank page and then we just keep rereading it and rereading it and it's hard to move forward. I would say just go forward. And if it's interesting to you, it'll be interesting to readers. And Meg, for you? I'd say if you're interested in writing horror, um, make sure you read all different kinds um, first, just to kind of like make sure that you are familiar with the genre, you know, Um, because uh, it's one thing to like watch Um, horror movies and maybe you want to write a script so that would be okay if you're watching horror movies but I think that if you want to write horror literature you need to be pretty well versed in in it first um so that you know you know all the all the tropes and you then you can subvert them which is really fun (laughs) awesome so I'm gonna say three words to you guys flashlights garlic and ghost equipment are you guys all packed up and ready to go Heck yeah, yes, we, got got, we both have a go bag, just like we're going to give birth. It's like, let's go. You know, we all have to be ready for that trip, right? To get in yeah. the car and that. But is yeah. that three things that we all should be carrying around if we're ghost hunters and, you know, looking for vampires and the spooky yeah. stories? And you never know when you need to add garlic to something. <laughs> we believe in seasoning our food. <laughs> So the, the vampires can stay far away, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Unless so they're really there... sexy. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so is there anything else that you ladies would pack in your bag for your trips? I mean, I think it's so important to have um, a working cell phone and a backup power source because it, just like every horror movie or movie set before cell phones, there's nothing worse than being stranded somewhere and with no one to call. And I would bring my three pugs because they're very (laughs) scary and they would scare off anybody. (laughs) They're very fierce. (laughs) Well, this is an amazing interview with you two beautiful ladies. Keep writing, keep scaring people, keep writing that horror and getting that genre out there. Uh, You know, happy Halloween, spooky Halloween. Let's get it out there. Thank Uh, you so much. So thank you guys again, Uh, Megan and Kelly. uh, If anybody would like to reach you, could you just give a shout out for your websites and then we'll wrap it up. 
Yep, our each of our names, kellyflorence.com and meghoftel.com. And then we also have horrorrewindthepodcast.com. Oh, I forgot about the podcast. So <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> for all the listeners out there, watch the end. You got to watch right to the end to get the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Thank well, you. Thank you so much, ladies. And thank you to all the listeners and viewers out there. I could not do this without all of you guys. And I will be back on Thursday with a new tea time. And we'll be talking about the COG, uh, Learning and Solutions. That's right. Carrie Graham will be in the house and she'll be talking about her platform and organization as well. And then we're going to wrap it up on the 28th and 29th. We're going to have... Jose Peral in and he'll be sharing his true life story of being a hostage in the Venezuela uh, event that happened a couple of years ago. And then we're going to wrap it up with some sex and stories and all of that good stuff with baby boomers with uh, Joyce Fiddler. She'll be in the house and she'll be wrapping that up and the press release will be out in two days. So check that out for the November lineup and then December and then we'll be doing a reunion show like we do every year. So stay tuned for all of that. So until then, thank you for all tuning in and joining. And I will see everybody on Thursday, same time, same place, and serving tea all over again to all of you guys. Thank you.